Okay, uh, so we're here for our uh, meeting for 4896. Uh, thanks for being here, guys. So um, I've got a couple things for you. One is a uh, marked up copy of some project uh, proposed contract language to incorporate some of the things we talked about the last meeting. And another one is an email from Pulsar Informatics that uh, talks about what I hope will alleviate one of your concerns about policies. So I only have one copy, it was 40 pages, but uh, and then this is the electronic copy. Okay. Um, is that electronic a bolt? No. Uh, here's the contract. Here's a copy of the email. If you want, I've got two copies. One of them. How about I let you have the hard copy and I'll just pull up the electronic here? Probably. Just uh, Article 8? Um, there's a few. Is I, there? This is the entire contract, so this. Oh. Um, but there's. There were a few changes, and I thought we'd just kind of walk through. Most of them are just language cleanup. There were a few places in the contract that. Uh, referred to shift employees, and sometimes they were referred to as 72-hour employees since our old FLSA schedule was a nine-day schedule with 72 hours worked, and so we had to clean up some of that language. So the substantial changes are just uh, in Article 2. I'll let you get it pulled up there, Andy, which is... Uh, is red line? It is. And that just captures that concept of uh, guiding decisions to move employees between uh, different apparatus or stations in order to proactively or reactively mitigate fatigue. And we included that in the management rights clause. Um, the next one is the Article 8 that I think probably encompasses the bulk of the changes. Uh, reflecting the language of a move to a 4896 schedule with one tour of duty uh, and then changing the language about hours worked and FLSA thresholds identifying a 24-day FLSA period. Um, we did, starting in that article there, start using the terms shift personnel and day personnel versus the old language uh, talked about the uh, you know, they talked about, uh, well, not so much here. They referred to them as a 72-hour employees in, in various cases. So we just started using shift personnel to refer to shift and day to those that are on, on days. And were there, there were some, too, where it said 56-hour. Right. Day. I mean, so we tried to go through and pick those up. And that's what a lot of the, uh, the changes are, is just those little cleanups. Okay. Um, the next one is Section B of that same uh, Article 8, the uh, <clears throat> regular work week. And this is uh, the agreement to meet to address any concerns. And so I'll let you read through that, that added Section B. And what we figured is that we would end up just striking the language that identified that we would move to the 4896 and outline this process since in a new contract it would become moot and then we replaced it with that language in section B there. One quick question. Um, just because this has got, I mean it's got the date of January 15th on there, do we need to reference our current calendar, our current schedule just so that both are in there until because this, when this is approved, obviously it will, it'll encompass both for a little while. Um, do we need to, to address that, or? That's a good question. Uh, one, one thought is that uh, the current contract, so this is the marked up contract, the current contract that was just ratified by both parties in September would be an appendix to this contract 
so that it was clear that that one is the guiding document uh, for a period of time and we may just need to reference that as the uh, the language that guides our current schedule until we move to the, the 4896. So, um, but I hadn't considered how that would be addressed currently. Okay. So, then as we move on, we get to Article 12, Extra Duty. There's just language changes to reflect a different uh, FLSA threshold and FLSA period. Article 16, uh, the vacations, birthdays, birthday, holiday, and Kelly days, uh, the reference to the day personnel and ship personnel. Again, further down in there, because they had previously been referred to as 72 hour FLSA and 40 hour work week. They're in section F. Same changes in Article 17, accumulation of sick leave. Uh, clarification in Article 21 on shift employee. Changing the, the shift employee was that part of just the, kind of the earlier red line cleanup project in the or, I, I, actually in the article twenty one yeah and there's a couple of them that have been like like the cleanup uh, yeah was that was that part of the original it's, yeah and I think it might have actually, actually been referenced well, in in that language in yeah so the final TA that we did referenced. To it as shift employees um, and that's because when we were trying to go through and, and get some of this sorted um, before we signed the contract then that was one of the one of the points that was that was brought up at that at that oh. stage in the game and so okay. so that that final TA from negotiations did say shift employees okay. to try to, to try to make that designation and then uh, section I is a new section under article 28 health and safety and that's the language uh, encompassing the fatigue risk management system. And I'll give you a second to kind of look at that language. It's not quite there. Let's. I think it would. Right now, we don't know until we get there and they examine our schedule what their recommended frequency of testing is. So we thought that it was premature to to call that out. Um, and then the only other uh, change is reference to shift employee and day employee on the vacation schedule. And where that last one was on the, what page is that? Uh, page 37, uh, Schedule C vacation, just to, again, updating the shift employee and day personnel, shift personnel and day personnel. Uh, they previously had been 
referred to as 72 hour work period employees and since we're changing FLSA that wouldn't be applicable any longer. Gotcha. So that is the language portion that we're proposing um, and then I wanted to I reached out to them I felt like one of your concerns in the previous meeting was the notion that we might have some really rigid uh, algorithms, if you will, that would guide decision making that would maybe not include the human element. And I wanted to kind of reach out to uh, Matt Von Wallen from Pulsar Informatics. That's his response. The second page is the email I sent him asking him to kind of help us understand how their policies worked. And this is what he returned. And so I was hoping that that would kind of alleviate some of the concerns about the rigidity of the problem, the policies and how much human involvement you know he he says that they rely heavily on human decision making and and the human element in in this program and that was i, I re-watched the webinar from the day that we had him in with us and he reiterated there as well that you know the system takes human involvement and humans to make decisions so i don't think it's just going to be a rigid set of rules that we have to follow okay Um, I think that I would definitely like to include some of the, the thought process in this email if we are developing an SOG pertaining to this, you know, and, and just try to memorialize that and make sure that that's captured. Um, one thing I think I think one thing that's been a concern about about from the labor side of things. Is, is whether or not this is going to be disruptive, and I understand that that, that they have to decide how they're going to determine that. Um, I mean, how the, the frequency of testing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think that it would be nice to be able to to get something in there to you know to to include that it's that it's not going to happen with too much frequency, if you get what I mean. Because I mean, obviously, if we had to do it like every two hours, that would be disruptive. And I know that that's an exaggeration, but but uh, but it would be nice to have have some of that spelled out, or at least have it spelled out that that it won't be disrupted to work. Um, Understood. Um, I that would be disruptive from our standpoint as well, mm -hmm. because obviously we have a an increasing call volume, we have training uh, and other. Um, activities that we're expecting you to engage in, you know, maintenance and, and vehicle checks and stuff. So that would be disruptive from our standpoint too. Um, it's my sense that that's not going to be an issue. I mean, obviously if they came back and said, well, we want you guys to test every hour from our standpoint, we wouldn't say, well, guys, I guess they want us to test every hour. We would say, Matt, that's not going to work. You know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know how to, put a limit without knowing what their recommendation is other than saying we don't want it to be disruptive to the work either so and I think one thing to consider is like they're working with airlines and pilots and stuff and and they've also taken that into consideration that they wouldn't be disruptive to their schedule maybe there's a triggering event that you know if you've got somebody that scores at a 12 and a BC recommends that they you know 
take a nap for a couple hours or something. Maybe you have them test when they come back on to see if it improved their score or something. Yeah. But I think all of that is going to be determined once they actually look at our schedule and what options you guys have for either moving people around or making yeah. recommendations for sleep or those kind of things. So I, I think I would leave it kind of broad um, at this point just because the company hasn't had a chance to like sit down with you guys and or with Ryan and them and work out well, I, those kind of details. So a broader language scope so it isn't disruptive versus... Yeah. But that's, in my sense, is these are all going to be SOGs, you know, from the frequency of testing. That's what their policies are. We will... Uh, make those into SOGs for us, and you guys will be involved in that process as we are currently. So. I think one thing to consider is the policies they're going to develop are going to require input from both. Right. So it's not like they're just going to define the rules and we have to, you know, exist with them. That's, that's not their goal. And so um, hopefully when you guys have more time to share you know what's going to work for your schedules and stuff too and then also provide a safety aspect um, within the policy I think those terms will all come together but for right now I don't know how you would define it since we don't have an answer from the experts uh -huh. well and one of the tricky things about this is that you know when this is probably gonna when you're gonna measure fatigue the most is probably gonna be it, when you go on calls in the middle of the night, or you know, that's that's when guys are going to be the most fatigued. Um, and I, so, it's not like as if somebody could go and and do a test on their way out the door. Right, but again, and he uh, he made this um, point in in the uh, the webinar. There's a difference between being sleepy and being fatigued. And so my sense is that this testing will measure fatigue, and we likely will only have to do it. I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't know for sure, but my sense is that maybe at the beginning and maybe at the end of the shift is, is what, if you were to ask me, that would be my guess. And, and maybe, you know, there was a suggestion in one of your bullet points last uh, meeting to use them as a decision-making criteria for late-night transfers potentially and so that could be something that we work into the policy but I, I, I again would just reference that he he talked about it's you know tiredness being tired late at night is not the same as being fatigued and having it affect your alertness uh, that this psychomotor vigilance testing will will, will reveal so I, I don't think that the testing is going to be uh, cumbersome, but, but then again, I, they haven't had a chance to look at our schedule and look at our workforce and make those recommendations. And just a reminder, that test is, it's a minute long total, but if, it, it can determine whether you're fatigued within the first 30 seconds. So if you prove that you're not in that range, it ends at 30 seconds. And so you wouldn't even have to finish the full minute if you're not showing signs. So that's yeah. convenient. It's not one of the five minute tests where it's cumbersome to sit there for five minutes. I think that's yeah. one advantage to this company is they've really refined that science down to determine in a short amount of time whether you'd need to check with somebody on later in the shift or something if they were showing signs of fatigue. And then another part was the software. Once you enter that number, it can also kind of, it was predictive on your level. So it could give the BC, um, I guess, a tool to say, okay, you know, most of my guys are great, they're going to be good the whole shift, but this one was already showing, you know, a little sign of fatigue after an event. At least then you would know, I think you should have some option for the BC to use it as a tool, like to say, I, you know, I want to retest somebody in eight hours to see if they're still okay to keep going or something. So I think you'd want to leave that freedom in there for the BC to, you know, use it as a resource to test again if they felt that it was necessary or they thought somebody's safety might be compromised because they were showing fatigue. So, And I envision it the same way that Ryan was talking about it. I envision it that it would be maybe coming on maybe at, after 24 hours and then maybe as you go off shift. Yeah. I mean, I, that's that's kind of just, in, in my head, that's the way I see it working. I just uh, um, want to make sure that 
that, that we protect the guys and make sure that that we don't you know that, that we don't we're not subjected to having to do it too often where it ends up becoming a problem and I do agree with what we put out further or earlier about I, I do think that you mentioned triggering events I think that a late night transfer could be a triggering event um, I think I think that that's something that that we can work on I just wanted to to make a point sure that's understood and, and we share that concern we certainly don't want to turn uh, testing into the majority of our our work day so what is the note that we'd like to put in here on this? Is this something that we'll review further? Is this? I, I think we intend to implement it with, you know, with the, with the rest of the policy there that is mentioned in uh, Article 28, the uh, health and safety. Okay. We agreed to uh, implement the FRMS fatigue risk management system as recommended by Pulsar Informatics regarding the frequency of psychomotor vigilance testing and policies to guide decision making to manage fatigue. Would you say uh, along those lines of if, if, the, if we feel like it's the testing is becoming cumbersome or slowing down work or whatever it's just becoming too much would you say that we could use the section B in article 8 as a tool to absolutely to work through that so yes. so there is a mechanism to right to me that would be a, a negative impact that was identified related to the schedule or or the policies that we've tried to implement to manage fatigue and then we would meet and try to come up with a solution um, so yeah I think that would be completely appropriate okay that's a great point. Um, and then one last thing as we were scrolling through this, when we were talking about overtime, the FLSA periods, that's that's just pulled straight from a, from a 24-hour work cycle. Yeah. Um, the, that's just uh, the FLSA. Yeah, the threshold, I believe, is 180. Let me get there. Which, which article is that? I'm, I'm trying to get there as well. I pulled the article, uh, or excuse me, the threshold off of a table in that uh, FLSA handbook, and that 182, I believe, is the threshold for a 24-day cycle, and uh, 192 is what we'd be working in that. So that, that's the differential between that. It's the Article 12, Extra yeah. Beauty, page 6. You notice before, like 68 was the threshold for a nine day, yeah, and then uh, so and 182 is the threshold for a 24 day. Yeah, I just, just wanted to clarify because I was sure that's where it came from, yeah. but I just wanted to make sure. Just a second to sure. have to have a brief discussion. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if, if one of the rooms is available or just go. Up. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we should be right back. How are you, sir? our discussion out there was really just about the Article 8 and, and figuring out um, how to kind of memorialize our current contract because we'll be working since or our current work schedule since we'll be working both of them over the term of this. Can I offer a solution that it occurred to me if you look at the front page of the thing it says amended as of and we have a date which would be the ratification date and then effective I would propose that even if we were to ratify this in the next few weeks, that it really doesn't need to be effective until probably January 15th when we start that new schedule. And, and because the only language changes deal with the new schedule. So I, I agree with that with the one exception. Okay. Um, the article, what is it, the, the 
The one about the um, Pulsar Informatics right. stuff. 29th? Yeah, 29th. I think 28th. Yeah, so, so I think you're going to want to implement that prior to January 15th. True. So, um, however, it's it's not going to be the full policy, you know, the the total fatigue risk management system. We would only be doing psychomotor vigilance testing for the first two months because we wouldn't ask them to build a section of policies for a a uh, schedule and the fatigue tracking in the fatigue meter. They take into account your work schedule and everything. We wouldn't ask them to build that for a schedule we're leaving. So the only portion that we would be uh, implementing would be the psychomotor vigilance testing. And um, as long as the union didn't have a, an issue with us asking them to participate in that from say uh, November 1st, -ish. I would like to get it in November 1st because I'd like to get two solid months of data prior to moving so that we can show the difference between one schedule and the one we're moving to, to truly kind of, in my mind, settle what a lot of people are claiming anecdotally about how they feel under the schedule we're moving to. I think it would be valuable to have that kind of data. Yeah, and we do too. And we just wanted to make sure that yeah. that we could do it. And so if you feel like that's, I don't know, is that something that we could just uh, agree to start through the labor management process? Would it need to be contained in any sort of MOU or contract? Or um, sorry, I'm just yeah. Okay. I. I mean, I think that I, I would like to say yes, um, that we could just do that for through labor management. I think that we can, that we can definitely have that conversation um, where we can definitely deliver that message in union meeting to our membership. But I do think maybe the cleanest would be that we adopt that section I in in an MOU, kind of in addition to adopting the the revised contract. Um, and just to kind of let you know what, what our what our timeline is and what we think we would probably end up needing to do is we would put out to membership or we have we have our meeting on Wednesday and so we would if, if you know provided that we have an agreement here we would show them the we would show them this red line copy or contract we would let people know and make people aware but then we would probably call a special meeting to to, to vote to ratify, and we feel like we can do that. Um, you know, we feel like we can we we should be able to accomplish that in the next couple weeks easily, and certainly prior to the next union meeting. Um, just we want people to have the ability to look it over prior to um, you know rather than just having a ratification vote two days out. Sure. Uh, I'm just uh, can I throw an idea out there? It's sure. just. A spitballing here could we put something in an SOG for from now until January or whenever this you, that kind of memorializes our understanding that we are willing to participate in the PVT until January and then this will take over is that because that's something we could do because I just I would like personally I think if we could just do this in one step it'd be easier for everyone right and uh, unfortunately uh, <clears throat> Jared is not available right now to kind of run this concept of what guides us until the implementation date and do we need a stop gap and would we just take care of it here um, we, we could uh, I guess we have a couple of things. And, and then the other thing that uh, on the PVT, you know, I don't want to put the January 15th start date off any further down the road. I do want to get some data under our current system. It takes them a few weeks to get the PV testing up and running for our personnel with setting up devices and doing some training. 
Um, but I need to have a solid commitment that that's the direction we're working from both sides in order to commit to expending the funds to implement the PVT. And so there are a few timelines at play there, um, and I'd like to have an opportunity maybe to discuss those with, uh, with the city. I was hoping to come out of today's meeting with a TA on this, but I, I don't know, do you feel like we're there? Um, you know, I, I feel like, well, one thing to just add, um, the only other part that, that I saw that, that I think would need to be addressed between now and January 15th is just the memorializing the 10 business days to, to meet and discuss negative impacts. Um, and I mean, I think that I, I, I think that we could probably do like Eric said and work, you know, I, I think that I'd like a little bit of feedback from the body, obviously, to go and take take this forward to them. Um, but I but I do feel like we could probably put that in an SOG form until January 15th and then have that SOG kind of go by the wayside. Um, I mean, and I, I say that without obviously without you having the opportunity to be able to talk it over with Jared and get that get that part of it done. But I do think I think uh, I think that we could that, that we're in a spot where we could probably be agreeable with with an effective date of January fifteenth on the front, and and the understanding that we work out the rest of those details in SOG. Okay. Um, one of the uh, things at the last meeting we talked about whether or not we could do any information sharing outside of an open meeting and because at the time uh, at the last meeting we kind of both had presented a a uh, sheet of paper with some points and uh, the feeling was that we weren't right here you know we were very close and we agreed at that meeting that the two pieces of paper had ident pretty much the same uh, concepts on them but I, but we hadn't necessarily agreed that this is the agreement that we're working on now that we're here and if we're in agreement that this document contains the details of the agreement to move to the 4896 I'm hoping that maybe we can work on some of those things outside of an open meeting uh, now that this one will go down you know, this will be submitted as the record for the open meeting as what was uh, discussed. And as long as we're both in agreement that we're working from this, I think it's okay for us. And I'll reach out to legal as well before we do it uh, for us to entertain the concept of discuss out in some of those discussions, either through the layer management process or the SOG process, which are what are outlined in here as, as possible resolution tools. So. And one other question is, uh, I mean, you mentioned the November 1st start date. Is that going to work with, with your timeline, having to work with council and stuff like that on that? I'm not sure. Those are some of the details I need to understand more fully. Okay. So. Yeah, I think, I think we're, uh, I think we are in com complete agreement on this starting January 15th. It's just that the transitional how do we transition and I think we agree with you on the intent we just want to make sure that it's the the transitional phase is, is done properly you know, does that does everybody agree with that that's our only concern is yeah I, I believe so and I think we can handle that so is that do we want to try to TA this and then take care of that kind of question of how we best address the transition from one agreement to the next agreement to ensure that there's not a gap uh, or do we wait and TA this at a future meeting? Um, as long as we put on the front of that that that, that is with an effective date of January 15th, um, I'm comfortable with TAing it and then, and then working out those small details. Um, I don't know if that requires you to to, to speak with the legal counsel prior to being able to do the same. I think I'm going to 
try to get some clarification from them as to whether this becomes effective as soon as it's ratified or whether we could project an effective date in the future. Traditionally, we ratify contracts before they go into effect, so I don't, I don't see a problem there. And I guess as long as we're open here uh, that uh, we intend for this to be effective, um, I just, I'd, I'd like to get that guidance. Okay. So it may require us coming back and it'll give you a chance to vet this at your meeting this week. I guess I would propose that maybe we try to set a, a meeting for later this week to tentatively TA this, this language. Okay. Does that sound good? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Could we... No. I was just thinking if we TA'd it and then... I'm, I'm comfortable TAing this and being on record as saying that we intend for this to be effective the 15th of January. Um, I don't think I'm comfortable writing that date in here and binding us to that other than the intent is for us to have this effective January 15th when we transition to the schedule. Uh, and I'm, I hope I'm just being honest that I want to understand and make sure mechanically I'm doing this correct. And unfortunately, I don't have the ability to get legal guidance right this minute. Uh, but I think we're obviously on record saying it's our intent to make this effective on January 15th. And I would be comfortable tentatively agreeing to this this language today if you guys are comfortable with that with that statement of intent about the effectiveness date. I would be. I mean, I think that's the way we do it now. Is we both parties ratify it uh, months before it right goes into effect. So I don't see any issue with that. I don't think that. I'm not. I don't think. There is an issue yeah. with that. I just want to make sure that yeah. Yeah. I'm not overlooking something yeah. that, that my legal counsel might catch. Yeah, and that's that. I'm kind of in the exact same boat. I mean, obviously, like like we've said, um, I mean, we we negotiate, and whenever we finish with with negotiations, then has an effective date in the future. Right. Um, and so, so I think that I don't think there's an issue with that. Um, I'm, 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 I'm good either way, but I would, I would prefer to have the, the effective date on the front. Okay. Let's come back on Friday, and, and I'll have a guidance for you. And it should be a quick meeting then, because we kind of both know what piece of sheet of music we're singing from. So. Okay. Okay. And then that'll give me an, uh, an opportunity to ask that separate question of how we, how we. Uh, Memorialize the PV test, PVT testing in the interim if this effectiveness date is January 15th. Okay. Maybe as they'll well have the, the resolution. Maybe they'll have the, the idea we're looking for on how to do that sooner rather than later. Yeah. I definitely want to get us there so that we can start moving in that direction. So. Okay. Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.